Kowalski, uh, Randy Langley, uh, Matthew Griffin, and we'll be supporting. The format is we have two entrepreneurs that speak every week. They speak for six minutes, and then the crowd, you get to give feedback and help with uh, good questions and feedback on their idea. <clears throat> So this morning, we usually have two presenters. The second presenter, unfortunately, got sick and was unable to be here. But we do have a surprise at the end by uh, Matthew Griffin. And um, our first presenter this morning will be uh, Ben Walker from a company called Buyers Point. Buyers Point is a 100% online retail business that does not sell flashy products, but has over 6,000 positive reviews and 50% growth year over year. So we're very excited to hear Ben Talk. So our first presenter, Ben Walker. Hello. I think that intro was probably a little bit better than I deserve, but we'll go with it. So my name is Ben Walker. I am the founder and owner of the Buyer's Point. But before we go into what the Buyer's Point is, let me give a little bit of a background on uh, a little bit about myself. So I've always had this passion for entrepreneurship since I was a little kid. And I remember back in elementary school, I used to make little paper jewelry and sell it to the other kids. <laughs> so that was my first failed venture. Apparently, uh, parents and teachers kind of frowned upon that kind of lifestyle, so you can't really do that. So I kept that spirit with me. And as I grew up, I went to college, graduated. And I think like most people, when I graduated, I had a ton of student loans. And I was trying to figure out, OK, what can I do to leverage something else, some kind of income, to be able to pay off these student loans. So I was thinking, and I was thinking, and I was thinking. And one day I was at a house party, and one of my friends said, hey, Ben, I actually have an old iPhone. That I, I got a new iPhone, and I have an old iPhone. Would you want to buy it? And I was like, well, sure. Let me see how much it's worth. So she said, well, I'll sell it to you for $50. And I said, OK. So I looked it up online, and it turns out I could sell that same phone for $150. And I was like, well, OK, let's do this. Unfortunately, like I said, I didn't have any cash. I was trying to pay off student loans. So it ended up taking me three months to save $50 to buy that phone. Three months later, I buy the phone, sell it online, get the return, and I'm like, great, this is awesome. So I start thinking, you know, I wonder if I could do more phones. So I get on Craigslist, and lo and behold, there's tons of people that have their old iPhones or Samsungs that they're trying to sell. So I start buying them one at a time and just selling them online, little by little, selling them and selling them. And that's where the idea behind Buyer's Point came up. So we've now been in business for five years. We're currently in our fifth year of business. And so what we are is a 100% online retail store. So the best way to describe that is, think of a brick and mortar location where you go in, you buy an item off the shelf, you go to the counter and buy it. It's the exact same concept, except we sell our items 100% solely online. What we sell, we sell consumer electronic accessories or complimentary items. For example, if you buy a TV, I sell the HDMI cable, I sell the wall plate, I sell the component box. If you buy a tablet or a phone, I sell the case, I sell the cables, I sell the adapters. What we don't do, we're not a drop shipper. If you guys are unfamiliar with that term, drop shipping is when Basically, a, a seller lists their items, but they don't actually own the items. A third party owns the items. That's great because it's, it's not much capital in that. So the way that process would work is, if you're a customer, you would come to me as a seller, buy my item that I don't technically own. I would send that invoice to the third party dropshipper. That dropshipper would then fill that invoice and send it to the customer. So like I said, that model is good because it's not much capital. The downside to that is, as a seller, I cannot guarantee the quality of the item, and I can't guarantee the shipping times. And if any of you guys have ever purchased something online, I'm sure you guys want to know, when you look for an item online, you want to make sure that's the item you receive, and you don't want to wait four or five days to get that item. You want it in, basically in a reasonable time frame. So at the buyer's point, we decided we're not going to go with that model. We're going to bite the bullet, take the capital expense, and own 100% of all the inventory we sell. So everything you see on our sites, we actually own and stock. Our focus. So like I said, we focus on small electronics accessories and component items or complementary items. The reason for that is, if any of you all have ever bought an accessory at a Best Buy or Radio Shack or really anywhere, if you go into a store, 
you guys know if you buy a case or buy any kind of cable, they're extremely marked up, they're extremely expensive. And quite frankly, there's no reason for that. It's just really just trying to have a, a huge margin. So we just, what we found out was, oh, if we go directly to the vendors, we can buy those same exact items, that same exact quality, mark it up just a little bit so we're still profitable. However, give the consumers a very steep discount. So online, you will find that our items are the, le the least expensive items for that particular item you can find anywhere in the nation. Where we sell. So like I said, we do online sales. So we're gonna be sold on Amazon.com and on eBay. We have our website, thebuyerspoint.com, but that's mostly for professionalism. So if you're a customer or you're a vendor and you wanna verify that me, Ben Walker, is a real person, I'm a legitimate business, you go to my website, you see all of my listings, you see everything about me, and that just makes you feel a little bit more comfortable with the transaction online since you can't see the person in person. So that's why we have that website, our, our website. U.S. market. So for the U.S., the each retail market is about, this year alone will be $319 billion. And that's been growing at 10% annually, and it's projected to continue growing at 10% annually. So in 2018, that market's projected to go to $420 billion. But let's, let me step back. I'm not a greedy person. <laughs> I don't need $420 billion. But if I can get a small piece of that, I'll be very happy. So we've been in business for five years. Those first two years is really about putting a system in place that works, getting a model that works, figuring out the right product, the right method of how we want to sell. And once we got that into, play, into place, we just shot off. So for the last three years, we have had annual growth of 50% every single year for the last three years. In 2016, we're expected for the first time to hit the milestone of $1 million in sales annually, and we're projected to grow to $5 million in annual sales by 2020. So as I said, these are the, lo these are the locations you can find me. If you have any questions, uh, any questions that you want to ask me personally, there's my contact email. You can also find me on Facebook. That is it. Okay, so it's question time. Um, we have some questions here in the audience first before we go to Twitter. You have a question right here. As far as uh, marketplaces go, have you looked at marketplaces that specialize in small electronics and accessories like you're talking about, uh, such as like Newegg.com? Uh, sort of, kind of, but not. So Newegg is actually more of a, would be more of a vendor for myself. So I'd, I'd actually purchase items from Newegg. Really the biggest marketplace that you guys probably know is gonna be Amazon and eBay. Uh, we, so we sell through them simply because it's zero advertising required. If you search for my item, it's gonna pop up. So to answer your question, we don't, we've only sold through Amazon and eBay because that's the primary traffic for online sales. Okay, right here. Okay, so my question first is, so it seems like your differentiation point is really on price. The, what about um, delivery? And the reason I think about that is uh, Uber is actually announcing delivering services. I think they've got it in New York now. Is there a way for you to utilize a different type? I mean, I think that's a great question, uh, one I haven't necessarily thought about, but I think that um, that's something I will, I will take into consideration. So I should have said that uh, also one of the reasons why this business myself is just me. I've, I've did this business solely myself, and I'm able to do that because all my inventory is sold on Amazon, and it's actually shipped through Amazon. So as technology, delivery technology increases on Amazon, then I will still benefit from that also. I have a question right here. Hi. Um, I'm Bev Anderson. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, uh, two questions. One is on your market size. Um, what you're, you said it's going to be 420 billion by 2020 or 2016. Okay. So, sorry. So what is that? What uh, so what are you sizing there? Is that the online market? What I mean I, in the United States, I, I wasn't quite sure what that was. And then I have a second question, and you may have just answered it. I mean, who are is this? I understand you started this business on your own. Have you grown? Have you developed a team yet, or where are you on that? 
Yeah, great questions. So the first one is that's actually the U.S. online retail market. So the U.S. market by 2018 for just e-commerce retail online will be $420 billion. The second question is, uh, no, I, it's actually just myself. I work from a laptop. I have my laptop right there. Um, <laughs> and I, at this point in time, I have no uh, plans to hire employees. What I did was I focused a lot. I learned early on that the key to scalability is automation. So I try to figure out as many things as possible to hand off to where I can focus solely on the strategic of the business. So I no longer, and let me back up a little bit. So when I first started, I was doing all the packaging and the shipping. I was working 16, 18 hours a day to make sure that was done. I did that for every single day for seven days a week for two years straight. So uh, I used to do that, but then there comes a point where you reach a critical mass where you can, once you grow a certain point, you, can't, you can no longer do that. So I realized at that point, I need to get everything off my plate and automate as much as possible. So Amazon does all my shipping for me, whether it's sold on Amazon, on eBay, on Shopify, they ship everything out for me. They also handle my customer service. So if you have a problem, when you email me, you're actually talking to Amazon and not myself. And that way, my daily job is solely making sure I have inventory in place and making sure I can grow my sales. Awesome, there's another question at the very back here. How you doing, this is Carl. Do you plan on expanding into the international market? So once again, it's actually, man, I love Amazon. I can't say enough about Amazon, the company. Myself, I will not necessarily, Ben Walker, uh, sell in the international market, but Amazon does. So my items, as long as they're listed on Amazon, anybody in the world can sell. About 30% of my sales come from outside the US, and that's simply because I'm listed on Amazon. Love it, I have another question here. I think you told me what the answer to my first question, which is why you and not somebody else, and I think it's the hard work. Uh, but I do have a question about how did you first learn how to become an Amazon seller and get into it? And my second question is how do you find your items, and can you tell us about that transaction process? Yeah. So I've always, it's kind of weird, so I've always loved selling online. I think if you want to be an entrepreneur, you hear the, the old adage that you have to find something you're passionate about. And I was really passionate about selling online. So when eBay first started in 95, I actually bought and sold my first item before I could actually drive a car. So I've been selling on eBay before I could even drive a car, or drink a beer, or any of that stuff. And uh, so I've always known about this. And it was just later on in life that I took that skill set or took that knowledge to turn into a business. And what was your second question one more time? Yep, yeah, so it's a good question. And that's probably the hardest thing. I think like most people that have businesses, vendors, suppliers is the hardest piece. So I've literally gone through hundreds, if not thousands of vendors to find, to, to find the formula for me. And my formula for me is I have to have quality items, I have to have consistency, and I have to have availability. So is, there are very few people in the United States that can provide that. So like I said, I've literally gone through hundreds of vendors one by one, trying them out before I stuck to a, a, a core group of vendors. All right, I have a question right here. Yeah, my name's Rob. Uh, a couple things. Uh, do your products have a warranty? And if I buy something and it doesn't work, what do you do about it? So, man, great question. My products have manufacturer's warranty because I sell only brand new items, so they're still in the retail package. So they have the, the manufacturer's warranty. And if you have a problem, I have a problem. I take customer service extremely serious. If you, come, if you say, Ben, I received your item, it was dead on arrival. The first thing I say to you is, I apologize. Ben Walker, to you, I apologize for that, and I'm gonna fix that. What can I do to resolve this for you? I can either give you an exchange item, or I can instantly give you a refund, but you let me know what you want to solve, resolve this issue, and I'll do that for you. I have a question over here. So when you um, are looking at how you price your items, mm -hmm. do you basically just type in that manufacturer part number and go to like Google Shopping and find out where else you can order it online and, and base your pricing off being competitive on other sites? Or how did you figure out that spot where your margins are good, uh -huh. but you're also the best option if someone's looking just based off price? Yeah, great question. So a couple of things. Uh, the vendors I have every quarter or every month, they send me a list and say, Ben, here's our inventory. And what I do is one by one, I go through that item they tell me what I can buy it for, and then I look on Amazon and eBay to see what I can sell it for. And also, you can look at historical data on both those websites to see the, 
the frequency of what they sold. So if I know how much I can buy it for, and, and based on those websites, how much I can sell it for, then I uh, know whether I can make money on it. I have a basically internal system where I say it has to be at least this gross margin, and if it's not, I'm not interested. Another piece of that is, um, is I also focus on accessories for a reason. Uh, iPhones, TVs, tablets, they're extremely expensive, and those are the big boys play. So when you, when you do those items, you're going to compete against the Best Buys, you're going to compete against the uh, Walmart, you're going to compete against those people. And to get any kind of fair pricing on those items, the minimum order, I mean, I'm talking to even get a phone call back, is about $300,000. So what I found was, one, there's so much competition in those items because there's, it's a lower margin but, but high profitability. I found there was not much competition in accessories. And another point is, on like a, say, a, like an iPhone 6. There's only one iPhone 6. So there's all the sellers are competing for that one iPhone 6. However, there's about 20,000 iPhone 6 covers. So, so I can sell one cover, and, I, and if you say I buy a white auto box, and for whatever reason another seller comes along and says, you know what, I want to sell a white auto box too. I say, fine, I'll sell the orange one. I'll sell the blue one. I'll sell the gray one. So there's less competition also. So I have a quick comment and question as well. You were like, when I first heard about this idea, it was really shocking to me because you were like the poster child for ideas are cheap and execution is king for it. What do you, what do you feel your success is due to? Uh, we heard hard work, which I think is absolutely, but uh, do you have other things that you feel is the competitive advantage allowing you to do this in a crowded space? Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is passion. You, you have to have a passion in what you, for what you're doing. If you don't have passion, then you're going to waste your time because it'll be a job and you'll get bored of it, you'll get burnt out. So the first thing is passion. I wake up every morning freaking excited to go to work. Dude, I, I mean, I freaking love my job. Um, the second is, is execution. I, had a, I heard a good quote that said that everybody has an idea, but very few people want to work hard consistently to execute it. So most of your competition goes out the window when it comes to actually executing. So like I said, the first two years, literally for the God, I mean, it was, it was insane. The first two years, my schedule was waking up at 7 a.m., answer emails. I was working full-time. I went to work full-time from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. I stopped taking lunches. All my lunches, I would go home and do shipping. After work at 6 p.m., I would go home. Oh, yeah, I was getting my MBA off at the same time. Go home, I would do homework, and then I would do packaging until about 1 a.m. And that was my schedule for the first two years, every single day, seven days a week, no vacations, no lunches, no friends, no nothing. So you have to have the uh, passion, the heart, the grit to just say, I'm going to get it done. And I don't care what you say, because everybody's going to tell you that you can't do it. Everybody's, the competition's going to be out there saying, I'm going to get you over. And it's funny, one story was uh, I had a, a competitor online that was really giving me a hard time. So I finally reached out to the guy, and I was like, look, either you're going to work with me or I'm going to beat you flat out. And he replied back something snarly, and I said, okay, well, here's the thing. I'm not going to sleep. So either you're going to sleep first or you're going to lose. <laughs> so what do you want to do? And, and you have to have that kind of grit to get it done. I have a question back here. This is maybe a little nosy, but uh, what percentage of your operating cost is uh, eaten up by Amazon? Uh, you, you use Amazon a lot, so what's your, what's your uh, cost factor using them? So Amazon has a flat fee for all sellers. It's uh, 32%. If you use Amazon Fulfillment by Amazon, it's 32%. And that seems like a lot, but it's, but it's not at all. When you add up the fact that they store your inventory, they have the man hours to package your inventory, they pay for the shipping, that's exclude shipping, they pay for the uh, shipping supplies, they pay for the customer service. When you add all that up, 32%, they can have it all day and tomorrow. I have a question right over here. Can you talk about the distribution between the two, between Amazon and eBay, and if, have you seen any sort of trends as to where, you know, where people are buying, or has that changed over time? Yeah, excellent question. I mean, I really, uh, I also like stocks, and unless eBay changes something uh, dramatically, it's, it's going to be a problem. So when I first started, it was actually about 60% eBay, about 40% of my sales were on Amazon. And now it has completely changed to where I'm doing about 95% on Amazon and about 5% on eBay. So, yeah, Amazon has really come in and, and caused some damage to the online market. I have another question over here. Well, mine was kind of about the same thing. So you know, I was just wanting to compare and contrast eBay. So, you know, what are they doing? What is eBay doing for you? And why are you still on there? Or is there any reason not to be. Yeah. So the, 
two things. One is strategic. Uh, I'm still at the mercy of Amazon. Amazon's a stickler when it comes to seller, and I do have great seller ratings. But at any point in time, Amazon wants to say, Ben, you can't sell in here any longer, I'm shut out. So if I don't have an established second platform, then that's all my revenue gone. So, I, so it's more of a, of a safety to, to stay on eBay. Have another question over here. Do you foresee going into other product lines at any point? <laughs> yeah. So um, what I have found is I, I'm really good at electronic accessories. I have barely even scratched the surface. Most of my vendors I buy from, I buy a heavy volume, and I'm still only doing about 1% of their product lines. So what I'll do is as I get more cash, as the business grows, I'll just buy more of those product lines. What I've done in the past, uh, obviously have a $5,000 write-off every single year because I try other areas and I fail at every last one of them. <laughs> so eventually you say, okay, I'm good at this. Let me stick with this and stop losing money. So. All right. And I have a question. Yeah, you see on television and online the, the ads about uh, make money from home in your underwear, or, yep. you know, things like that and, and regarding what you're doing. And I think it's cool to actually see someone who is doing that. You see a lot of advertisements about I'm going to teach you and things like that. How do you, have you had people approach you about you teaching them how to do what you did? And can you talk about some of those experiences? Yep, absolutely. So first thing is, if anybody ever tells you you can make a dollar quickly, run. Run. But first come a liar to their face and then run. It's, uh, it's just not possible. I mean, it's hard work. Even if you find a way to be efficient at making money, the point of becoming efficient takes time. So, so all those scams online, I mean, they're scams, and, they're, and, it's, and it's just it's wrong. People work too damn hard for their money to get scammed out of it. So save yourself the time, the money, the emotion, and just don't listen to it. Um, people have come to me and said, hey, look, I like what you're doing. I was doing it full time, and I want to know how I can do it also. So what I've done is, look, I think it's selfish if you find something successful and keep it to yourself. It's just why? That's not, I mean, what do you gain by that? If you die and you're rich and you die, who cares? But if you make a whole community of people more successful, they're able to make their family successful, they're able to make a whole generation successful, and that's where it is. So if you have any questions on how you can get started with this, I love talking about it. I, I'm not, I don't care about the competition. I, I don't care. I'll be more than happy to sit down with you, have lunch with you, and tell you how to get started. The, the hardest part is not getting started. The hardest part is staying started and not quitting. <laughs> I like that. Okay, question right here. Thank you, Ben, very much. Um, could you repeat the part about where you wear, where, where your merchandise is warehoused mm -hmm. in Amazon's role. I thought I heard you say Amazon for 32% handles the shipping and handling, but then I thought you said it was under your control, so I'm confused. Could you repeat yep. that? Fair enough, right? So, so instead of having a warehouse in the back of my house or anywhere else, Amazon warehouses all of our inventory. So the way that process works is I buy from a vendor, I send my vendor a PO, they ship the items directly to Amazon, it goes into the Amazon warehouse, and then they, whenever an order comes online, their person picks it from their warehouse and ships it out. That's when you see, uh, if you see something like fulfillment by Amazon, when you buy an item, that's what they mean. It means that it's at their Amazon warehouse, and they're shipping it out. I still own the inventory. The only difference is, instead of it being in the back of my backyard, it's at their warehouse. But we own 100% of the inventory. Okay, we have a question from Twitter from Tom McCabe. He says, great presentation. What has your journey, what has your journey been from 2006? What's been going on in the last nine full years? Um, well, I graduated college in December of 08, so I think it really starts in 09. The journey has been um, having a crap ton of student loans and trying to figure out how to get out of debt. Debt, if you're in debt, you are literally, for lack of better terms, a slave to the corporation. You have to work. So the minute I graduated and I saw and I realized this trend, I was like, nope. So the, so the journey has been trying to figure out how to get rid of all that debt and then how to start a successful business. And that journey has been just simply working, once I figured out, working hard to make it happen. And then one last question from the audience here. Uh, you and I have talked, and I know that you're a huge advocate of just kind of the bootstrap mentality and doing things yourself. I'm curious what your view is on uh, angel investors and gaining capital and seed money for your business. Is that something you're looking for? Is that something you're interested in? What's kind of your philosophy regarding that? Yep. I have, I have a tendency, tendency to not speak on things that I'm not very well versed in. So I don't know that whole process of venture capitalists and I don't know the whole process of angel investors. For myself personally, I haven't needed that yet. 
Um, I have thought about maybe selling a piece of equity in my business in the future, but what I realize is I want to make sure that I'm at a point in time where I can sell it at a full valuation. If I were to sell it right now and I double next year, well, then I just cost myself that gap in, in money. So I want to make sure if I do go out for some kind of investment, I'm at a point in time where I think I get the full value of that investment. All right, Ben, you know the format. So our final question for you. As I come around the corner, you can't even see me. Um, what can One Million Cups do for you today as a community? All right. So I'll, I, they told me not to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. The, <laughs> the, the first thing is I've been in Tulsa for six years, and I had no idea this community was here. I think it's amazing that there's a, a room full of about 40 or 50 entrepreneurs that are all like-minded. So I think the first thing is getting the word out so people like myself, people like the people sitting in this room right now can communicate with, with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are a different breed of, breed of person, and it feels good when you have a, com a conversation with an entrepreneur because you're on that same wavelength. The second thing is on the business side, right now there is absolutely nothing out there that allows you to forecast um, what your sales are going to be going forward. So for instance, I know historically all my sales, but I can't say on a chart that says, Ben, at your going rate, this is what you will be at the end of the year. I can do a ref estimate of like weighted average or whatever, but I can't be specific on that. So if anyone out here, <laughs> look at this guy, if anyone out here know, has that ability to create some kind of program that can take historic sales and take weekly uh, variations to create some kind of forecast of where the sales will end, I'd be, I would love to talk to you. And you also guarantee you'll have a heck of a market out there for people like me that need that need that reporting. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you guys. That was a great presentation. As uh, Alex mentioned at the beginning, our second presenter unfortunately cannot be here today, so we will have to reschedule. But we do have a few announcements and a, uh, a special announcement at the end of this, so let's just dive right in. Uh, if you are not on our email newsletter, please email us to sign up. You can just send us an email at Tulsa at WomenCups.com, and we'll get you signed up to the newsletter. Uh, if you've presented here before, you can go and become a passport presenter at other One Million Cups across the nation. Right now, today, in 72 other cities, at this exact time, people like you are meeting, and there's a great opportunity for you to get in front of a wider audience. The Forge does have openings in for office space, so please contact Jessica Flint at TulsaChamber.com to see how you could apply to get one of those spaces there. Great area. There's free Mountain Dew. That's diet, unfortunately, but... It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you have an announcement, please email us. We would love to hear what the community is doing and get it in front of everyone on our newsletter. Also, The Mine is accepting new fellows. The deadline is July 12th. They had a great event yesterday at The Forge, so hopefully some of you were able to attend. And OK Coders does have a happy hour, or not that a happy hour, a uh, career workplace uh, event on July 9th from 6.30 to 8.00. And uh, this is a new event that someone informed us about. Men of Vision and Elite Women of Tulsa are hosting a conference August 14th through 15th. For more information, please visit BreakthroughTulsa.com. And here is our special announcement. One Million Cups is running a nationwide competition, and there are a few rules to apply. But uh, basically the gist of it is that if you have presented at One Million Cups or do present before August 2nd, you can enter. If you are a startup that is under five years of age, you can enter. And if your startup displays the intention or ability to scale in a disruptive way, then you can enter. What's going to happen is that all of the startups that apply across the nation will be put into this competition. If you make the cut, you'll be going to Kansas City, to the headquarters, and you will receive a $10,000 award if you win, personal coaching, mentorship, business opportunities. There's a lot that goes into it. So I'm going to turn over to a video from the people who actually put the competition together. We're looking for one in a million. What does one in a million look like? Have you ever seen it? Does it look like this? Or this? If you've ever presented at a One Million Cups gathering held every week in more than 70 locations across the country, then maybe One in a Million looks like you. This year, for the first time ever, 
Open exclusively for One Million Cups entrepreneurs, the One in a Million Startup Showdown will be a featured event during Global Entrepreneurship Week. One in a Million was created to provide educational resources to entrepreneurs and showcase some of the stellar startups in the One Million Cups community. Fifteen finalists will be selected to come to the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City on November 17th and 18th, where they will receive coaching and gain valuable insights to sharpen their startups. The top five startups will be selected to take the stage for a first-of-its-kind Wednesday morning presentation that will be streamed live to all One Million Cup sites across the country. The winning startup takes home $10,000. Here's what you need to know. Your startup must have presented at a 1 million cups before August 2nd, 2015. Your startup must be younger than five years old and based in the United States. Your startup should have plans to grow with a scalable and disruptive business model. Don't wait to submit your company for this nationwide competition. One in a million will accept applications through August 7th. That's it. Actually, there's more to it than that. So visit us on the web to learn more about how your startup can become one in a million. So if you are interested in that competition, please talk to us. Please go to the website, apply. It's going to be a lot of fun. But to wrap things up, we do have another giveaway today. So who here is new? Is this your first time being here today? And did someone bring you for who is new? Oh, all right, here we go. We have a gift for you, a one million cup presentation. And who else is new and just wandered in?